Um, I'm going to demonstrate my favourite ferment, which is beet kvass. And I guess there's a couple of reasons why this is my favourite ferment. The first one, arguably the most important one, is it is super, super, super simple and easy to do. And it's also really fast. And for me, it's always been an issue. I've always been really busy, but now I'm a mum, I run my own business, so it's even more important. So that's the first part. But the second part is that Beekabas has all of these extra amazing qualities. So I'm sure all of you here know about the benefits of the good bacteria that we need to populate our gut with, yeah? Does everyone know about that? Yeah, so we know that there's, you know, trillions of bacteria on and in us that, you know, good and bad we need to sustain health. And so obviously beet kvass delivers those bacteria and, and in really healthy and amazing doses. But it also does some other things. So it's an amazing blood tonic and it actually alkalizes the blood. Um, I don't know if you know, but um, beetroot is quite well associated with cleansing the liver. So it's also a liver cleanser. Um, it's also been proven in scientific studies to be um, anti-carcinogenic. So it's a really powerful, healthful tonic. And I guess the best bit, so this is sort of three, I said two points, so I think this is more like three. It actually tastes really good. Did everyone try it up there? It's really delicious. It's really easy to take. It's really palatable. Um, I'll talk about dosage later, but I'll start with the demo. So I'll talk about what we need first. So we need, oh, I'll talk equipment. I'll just probably talk about it all at the same time. So we need a two litre jar for this particular recipe. Now, um, by the way, we what we do is we send you guys the recipes, all of the recipes with instructions and photos, and it's super clear and beautiful and easy to use. And we do that tomorrow. And the reason that we do that, I'll send that all to you tomorrow, is because if you're writing notes, you're just looking down and you miss bits. So it allows you to just relax and pay attention. No need to take any notes today. So everyone's inbox, check it tomorrow. So a two litre jar, you can just use a mason jar or you can use one of these, they're sometimes called, um, what are these called? Fido's. Fido's yeah. the brand, yeah. Fido is the more popular brand. So you don't actually need, for the sauerkraut, you need an anaerobic environment, which is basically an environment without oxygen, but you don't need that for beaker bass. So you can just get, you know, your standard screw top mason jars, which you can get from your kitchen warehouse and places like that. So in this instance, we're using two litre. You need your beetroots, chopping board knife, all of those fun things. Salt, so usually salt is um, pretty critical in a lot of fermentation practices. Now, I feel like we don't really touch too much on salt, but I just want to sort of stipulate that it's important to get a good quality salt, so either a Celtic sea salt or a Himalayan salt. Um, sometimes I hear of people going to say Coles or Woolies or somewhere like that and getting maybe rock salt or something like that, but you, what you definitely don't want to get is sodium chloride. And sometimes they, like Saxes and those types of brands have actually packaged them up as like rock salt and sea salt and stuff like that, but that will actually hamper any um, fermentation, any of the fermentation process, because sodium chloride is sort of antibacterial. So good quality salt. You need a starter culture. So you can use whey. We've got instructions in the um, recipe, well, I guess the instruction manuals that we'll be providing you with, how to make whey out of yogurt. You can make it out of raw milk if you want to. Obviously, you're meant to have a bath in that milk and not actually drink it. We won't talk about that here. Um, and you can also use something like this, so it's Foley's Gut Shots. Just something, I guess, a starter culture, so it's really gonna We're actually gonna teach the, how to make that as well. So we yeah. veered away from, from, from whey, um, mainly because of the whole dairy thing and people are a bit paranoid and everyone seems to pipe up in the workshops. And so we basically experimented around with different cultures and found that sauerkraut, gut shots or the sauerkraut juice seems to work pretty good too. I still think whey is, um, is preferred um, personally, but kraut juice will work. Um, and in the notes there is a video link, I've got a YouTube, an unlisted YouTube video to the process of how to make whey. It's pretty straightforward. So, um, and also, 
usually wouldn't use this, but um, filtered water. And Jez is going to wax lyrical about the importance of thorough filtration systems in terms of just generally, obviously, you cannot use tap water. Chlorine will kill any bacterial growth, so that's out. But filtered water, the more filtered, the better. Obviously, you don't want to concentrate toxins, and that can happen in the fermentation process. So I think that's everything, and if it's not, I'm sure that it will present itself as I demo. So um, two beets, and again, probably preaching to the converted here, but obviously organic is really important. And I like to not wash them because I feel like there's lots of little bacteria there from the beautiful organic soil, but Jezza likes to wash them, so whatever. Whatever you feel is better. I'm just gonna like, take off the she's still, tails. she's still alive and she's been doing it that way, so. <laughs> I showed you how to make beet kibass once upon a day, didn't I? Give you credit on that. <laughs> but now you show me everything, so. <laughs> so just chop it up. You don't have to be like super, you know, specific about it, but I probably chopped them up to about that size. Can everyone see that? Sort of, I guess, what's that, like eighths or something? Chuck them in. Now, with the salt, I just did it earlier because I tend to always mess it up but you want a digital scale because the salt has actually been um, sort of tested by the mad scientists over here. So it's actually 24 grams per two liters or 12 grams per liter. So you have to get some digital scales to weigh that out. Just chuck the beet in. Chuck the beet in. And the other really good thing to do is wear white because you'll always <laughs> get beet root on you. <laughs> And I actually spilt the beet kibass that I made here on the inside, on the like car, what was it, the mat of my car on the way here, so that was awesome, luckily they're all white. So you just put your beets in there, the salts in there, and then I'm just going to, oh, actually, my starter culture. Yeah, look, obviously if it was a, for a commercial grade or for vast quantities, you would want to ensure that you sterilise properly, otherwise you want to make sure that you're washing it and not with something that's particularly antibacterial and definitely making sure it's dry, especially if you're using tap water. Um, do we still have in the notes in how the to notes sterilize? There is like, like an official sterilization technique which uses the oven and 150 degrees and all that sort of thing, but um, in reality, like we've been doing this now for uh, quite a number of years. Nearly 10 years. Um, and if, as long as you just wash it really well. Um, and make sure your hands are clean, all that sort of stuff. So just you know, good, proper hygiene. And then, as Sarah said, just making sure everything's dry. I tend to use a lot of paper towel when I'm fermenting, so. Where is the paper towel? Oh, MYA, <laughs> anyway. Paper towel's really good because it sort of obviously absorbs everything, um, as opposed to tea towels, which may have some, back, you know, some nasty bacteria on there. Um, and yeah, so I don't, it, you don't need to go to all those lengths. Um, so in terms of the starter culture, for the two litres, it's two tablespoons. So this is like an old school tablespoon. Uh, so one, two, and then, is it looking pretty complicated? Does everyone think they're going to get quite confused by this and have to refer to their notes? <laughs> yeah, it's pretty good. So I like it. So then you just add your water. Ideally, this would be from a Zazen water filter, which is the gold standard as far as we're concerned. And I'll let Jessica talk to you about that later, but it filters absolutely everything out. And in fact, this water is from a Zazen water filter from my home. Hey, okay, I think I'm going to be able to make it. I thought I didn't have enough. Oh, I'll just top it up a little bit. So you want to leave a little bit of room in the top. I reckon that's about good. Okay, wise one. And then I usually, and I don't think we have anything here, so I'll just sort of pretend, but I usually get a wooden spoon and just give it a good stir. If you've got like a clip lock like this, then you can you could probably give it a shake. If you've got a mason jar, they're, they're a bit dodgy, they sort of leak and stuff. So, um, and then you just put it in a cool, dark place. So you don't want it in bright sunlight on your kitchen, you know, bench or something like that you probably want it in the pantry or somewhere where it's a little bit obscured and a little bit on the cooler side and it's going to sit there for seven to ten days so 
How easy is in that? This, in this cold winter, <laughs> more like maybe 14 days. Yeah, yeah. Maybe. The winter that never ends. In um, fact, it, I've actually found this this winter it has been a bit tricky with some of the ferment so that extra coldness actually has been a bit of a problem so yeah in which case there are other options like um, you can get like heating mats like these little things that plug into the wall that you can sit them on it just gives it a, like a little bit of warmth um, otherwise you can get belt like these devices that kind of like a belt that wrap around um, it just sort of gives a bit of extra warmth because if it's too cold then it's then it's just going to inhibit the good bacteria and they're not going to do their thing and then it's an open slate for any organisms to take over so whatever was you know already on that beetroot because there's bad bacteria on that beetroot there's good and there's bad so the idea of the fermenting process is they will die off and the good ones will proliferate and, and take over basically provided it's the right environment and right condition salt ratio um, and that sort of thing um, and also over time and you probably would have been able to see it but we transferred this to another container a lot of them will actually display a white sort of film over the top and people get very nervous about it so now we also include that in the leaflet so it's called if it doesn't have any mold on it and it's just white it's very innocuous and it's basically just called calm yeast you just get a spoon you can do it you might notice it after five days seven days you know part way through the process you just get your spoon and you just scoop that off and then just leave it, put the lid back on. Um, if there are fairy mouldy bits, then get your house tested for mould and definitely throw it out and try again. Um, there definitely shouldn't be and you definitely don't want to drink that. And I think I have drunk the mouldy one before, it's disgusting. So, so that's the simple preparation process. Amazing, I love it. And then here is one that we prepared earlier. So you can see the colour difference. This is where I'm going to stay my t-shirt. Now that I've said that, I'm definitely going. Do you want me to do this part? Yes, that's a great idea. You do you, this you part. You can talk both. But you can see the difference in colour, yeah? So that's, how, how long did you ferment that for? Uh, that one was maybe eight days. Okay, so yeah. obviously as the nutrients and all that sort of stuff leach out, then obviously it changes colour. And the odour is super strong. Everyone can come and have a whiff of it later if they want to. It smells like farts, doesn't it? <laughs> My car smells like farts, I think. <laughs> it's it's um, kind of weird. Like they, like the mints, they kind of don't smell so great sometimes. But they taste amazing, so it's sort of... Yeah, my sauerkraut smells weird. pretty farty too. So, um, <laughs> so they typically recommend that you use plastic because it's not going to have any antibacterial qualities. You just want to minimise any antibacterial stuff at all in the process. Hand washes, wipes, anything that might be around the house. Don't have those things because they're killing healthy bacteria anyway. Um, but so plastic is the go, and Jezza has this amazing strainer thing. I have some weird thing at home. So Big W that's lasted me almost so, six years of fermenting. So there's your beets. Um, I think we do still have a recipe for a um, beet, like fermented beet dip as well. So you can actually use those if you want to do that as well. So keep those. I know people just like snack on them or chop them up and put them in their salads, whatever. Whatever's clever, it doesn't really matter. You can definitely, you know, not waste them if you want to. And then typically what we do, funnel, come on little helper, which one should I put it in, that, that one? one. Yeah. Um, so typically what we do is find a beautiful glass bottle. I don't want to do that. <laughs> <laughs> and we just pour it in. This is, this is essentially what you drank when you came in. And so this little bad boy lives in your fridge and the recommended dose is two 30 ml shots per day. So um, I guess people always ask, so I'm just going to answer it, how long will it last? I've had a bottle in there for, it's got to be a year and it's delicious and it's fine. Um, so, and I think you've been rocking old ones, although the recommended amount of time is six months, so maybe don't take our advice on that. If you die, we take no <laughs> responsibility. <laughs> um, but yeah, the only the other thing, thing is, with, like, if something goes wrong with them, you generally are going to smell it. You know, like off chicken, everyone knows what that smells like. We intuitively and innately know when something's not quite right. And the other one's the visual, obvious stuff, like green fuzzy mold, black mold, all that sort of stuff. You'll you'll notice it. If it's just that white layer that Sarah mentioned, no no troubles. That's calm yeast. But the there's, General rule, if it's green and fuzzy or black and fuzzy, then just, just turf it, throw it out and start again. And I guess to the uninitiated, if you haven't actually fermented before, then maybe don't 
after tonight, go home and make sauerkraut and then have your bigger bass and, you know, be down, downing it like yoga yeah, shots and, you know, eating kvass like you, as your only vegetable. Obviously, you wouldn't do that, but um, some people do find that they start to get a reaction when they incorporate fermented foods. It might be some bloating, it might be some irritation through the gut. So, um, you just want to make sure that you start slowly. So, if the recommended dose for beet kvass is two shots, and you haven't had a lot of fermented foods, then start with one and just ratchet your way up to that. But how easy is that? Hands up, who's making beet kebabs? <laughs> yeah. um, yes. You said twice a day or 60 yes. mils of shots. Um, the little 30, 30 mil shots, yeah. Um, do you remember like spacing it out? Like do one morning and one night? Yes, one yeah. yeah, yeah, exactly. I think and so to start with, especially. Um, yeah. Space, you know, and have, maybe have it, having it with your food as well, sort of a bit easier on the digestive system. It Plus actually they, they digests. Help with di yeah, with it's actually well. got some digestive enzymes in it, so it can actually facilitate digestion, and it can also help with um, sort of constipation and things like that. It helps with bowel motility. So, yeah. You can. We do have another recipe in there, which is exactly that. So, the question was, can you put ginger and turmeric in there, the turmeric? Um, you can, you just, same thing, you just chop up fresh ginger, fresh turmeric, um, and just add it in whatever dose, what, whatever quantities you want really. Um, that's quite a good way of doing it too. And we know that with the studies that fermented turmeric is more beneficial than plain turmeric. Things change and chemicals alter in structure and they're more powerful basically. Same with beaker bass, like, like what's, what's in like this here, as opposed to what's in the final product is different, right? Like the chemicals that start in here, they go through those enzymatic reactions as they ferment and you get new chemicals that are formed and they're the ones that have the health benefits. The anti-carcinogenic effects that they've done studies on with beet kvass come from those chemicals that are formed through the fermenting process. There's another question here. Yeah. Um, how many times can you use the end product as a starter culture before you start to dilute so we typically don't suggest using, the, as in the beetroots or the beet kvass. Beet We don't usually recommend using the beet kvass, although you no, probably could. You but can. We, we typically suggest that you find another starter culture. There are some recipes. There's lots of really dodgy recipes on the internet, by the way, that say you, you ferment it for like three days and you add all this salt and crazy stuff. So, But um, some of the recipes say you can use salt, but it doesn't really seem to work. It doesn't provide the same flavour. So whey or another starter culture, I would recommend. And the beets, I've tried to reuse them on occasion, so just filling, just taking out the one um, batch of kvass, adding some more water, adding some more salt for starter culture. It's never as concentrated because obviously it's taking out all of those nutrients, so yeah. Mm. Yeah, I, don't, I, I, wouldn't, I, I wouldn't use this as a starter culture. So I think that I think that's what the question was. Could yeah. you use this as a starter coach? Is that, is that did I interpret that right? Yeah. So you certainly could, um, just like you could use a probiotic as a starter culture, just from our experimenting around, because there isn't as much um, scientific literature in the microbiology of beet kvass as there is sauerkraut. Um, so this has been more a bit of playing around and I guess a bit more of the art of it. And from my experience personally, whey and the kraut juice seem to produce consistent results. If you wanted to use beet kvass as a starter culture, I'd recommend getting bio beet one, the one that you tried. Their starter culture they use is a biodynamic culture and it's their own thing that's kind of the secret to the formula and it's a pretty amazing product. That, if, you, if you wanted to use that as a starter culture, I'd, I'd probably just follow those same sort of um, ratios, so like two tablespoons of that kvass for the starter culture instead, maybe a little more. You can, give, you can play around with it a bit and just see what works. So, in saying that you're using the crown shot, in the kvass, obviously you're still getting all the nutrients and the, and the goodies from the beetroot that leaches out into the water. Mm -hmm. But then are you only multiplying those bacteria or are you yep. helping those bacteria to multiply as well? So you will, you, yeah, so you're getting, this is getting a bit more technical now, so <laughs> some people will like this, some people won't, so tune out if you don't, but so what, what's, what ends up being in this ferment is, is a combination, so what was already in those starter cultures um, or in that sauerkraut juice, so all those lactic, lactic acid bacteria, all those lactobacillus, um, plus what was on, in, on the um, beetroot as well. Yes, yeah, so it helps start the beetroot up. 
Yeah. Yes. yes. Yeah. And then, and then, yeah, just sort of it's a cascade of events. Like it just, you get, it just multiplies over time. Is that it for that one? I think so. And then there's, so we do have another recipe. Uh, the eggs, the probiotic eggs. Um, so it's kind of like pickled eggs, I suppose. So all you do is just get hard boiled eggs. So the rest of, like, again, the recipe's in your thing. Now this does smell like farts. <laughs> everyone can everyone can attest to that. So all we do is we get half half kvass, okay, and half ACV, apple cider vinegar, and you put some spices in. So you've got some cinnamon in there. Um, I like cloves, um, allspice, all that sort of stuff. And then you just chuck this in the fridge for it, and you let it go for a couple of days so that. The, um, so the so the so the and the the apple cider vinegar infused through the egg, and then when you these are good for kids though they tend to love this stuff like cut them open and so they're they bright look really purple pretty and, and quite nice pretty. And salads and things. I would um we don't know like what the time frame is for how I mean these these could be preserved like a like a pickled egg, but mm. I'd, we just say just have them eat them within a week, just like you would standard a hard boiled egg, the, the time frame on it, just because I, I don't know, I haven't seen any scientific data on it, so I don't want to give off some bad advice and someone gets, <laughs> gets ill, so we recommend consuming these within a week, but in reality, who knows, it may last a long time, I, I don't want to test it out. So how long before the colour infuses the about, about two days, you could probably poke holes in them as well if you wanted to, like with a skewer first and then, then do it, I'm a bit lazy. Um, just sort of, just sort of go at it like that. Would you um, get the treatment for the pickled nah. <laughs> <laughs> Not to not waste any goodness. <laughs> no, it's, it's it's more of the pickled side of things okay. because of the apple cider vinegar. Oh, even yeah. though that's a ferment. <laughs> yeah, I mean, you could, you know what would, you could do? You could dress your salad with it. Yeah. If you wanted to. Dilute it down, and you, the, with the kvass, you don't have to have it. Yeah, you don't have to have it as a salad dressing. As a shot, you can have. Um, you know, make it for salad dressings and in juices and smoothies and all that sort of stuff. But um, I guess if we don't stipulate, then people will go home and like pour a whole glass of kvass and start drinking it. So that's probably OTT. Mm. <laughs> I think that's it for that. Yeah. Any other questions? Yes. To that stage to put it in the fridge. Fridge, yeah. Both of these go in the fridge. Yeah. yeah. Once, they've, once they've done their fermenting. They're in, into the fridge. I like these bottles because they they trap the if it's if there's still some secondary fermenting going on and there's gas being produced, it kind of reabsorbs that carbon dioxide and gives it a bit more of a, a bit more of a fizz. Um, whereas other jars aren't going to do that because the gas is going to escape and it's not going to reabsorb. I thought I saw another hand somewhere. No. Questions? Yes. Um, so Yeah, there's, I mean, there's no yeah. hard and fast rules. Um, yeah, you, I mean. I guess that's just like the idea of getting like a probiotic. Yeah, I played around with it for a while. I was doing sort of like mini fasts and having those yeah. in the in the morning just to as a, kind of like a cleanse and. Nothing happened. I wasn't rushing to the toilet, and yeah. I've had it a lot of times on an empty stomach. Yeah. It's fine. A lot of people say that it's better to have probiotics and things in the evening. Um, and Jessica can probably say why that is, but yeah, I think on an empty stomach is fine first thing in the morning if you have a you know tolerance to yeah. fermented foods and your stomach's you know relatively resilient. Yeah. Probably probably a good point to maybe like step in now and give a little bit more of the. Like the health stuff and the and the clinical side of it, um, so it's a good question in, yeah, in the in the refrigeration in the section. Sometimes they come from Germany and places like that that they serve with the whatever they are the bratwurst and things like that, not mm. those. Yeah, um, yeah, I think that's pretty Don't much covers much. covers yeah. covers most of it. So yeah yeah it's good, probably a good idea yeah to to vary it around with the oats and what we teach we're teaching the fundamentals like you know you can't sort of teach the hard stuff first you kind of 
So what, what you can learn from here is then how you can then take the principles and expand. We'll cover a bit more of that with the set. The, was it the iron tonic? The, the, question, the question was, with, um, with turmeric, is it a good idea to add black pepper? Because black pepper has been shown in the studies to increase the bioavailability of turmeric. Um, I think what you'll find is what you're doing with, when you're fermenting it is probably going to do the exact same thing, probably more than what black pepper does in the raw state. But, you know, crack some black pepper in there as well. Probably that 2,000 might then become 4,000. Who knows? Might go down too. Who, I don't know. <laughs> Not everything's good, right? Like, there's, there's a, there's a you know, other side to the coin. I don't believe everything I say. But, you know. Because with the, there's like, it's, especially with sour curve, it's, it's kind of like a bit of a bell curve with, in terms of the probiotics. Like it gets to a certain time frame where it peaks and then they will start dying off as well. So it's a bit of a sweet spot. But when you, unless you're testing, it's pretty hard to, 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 um, to get all that down pat. But we'll have a bit more of that. Last question. Is there a piece of one of the other jars mm -hmm. that actually uses specific culture? They'll have like cabbage, mm -hmm. onion, blah, blah, blah. And Start a culture. They start a culture, whereas before these ones don't, they uh -huh. just are vegetables. So what do they use as, or are they literally using the organic time process of just letting it basically go more? I think all these use a starter culture. No, they don't. No. So the question was, um, some companies use a starter culture with their ferments and some don't. So for instance, what, for instance, what you tried tonight, the Foley, the Foley's ferments, that's a, tip, that's a standard wild ferment, it's what we teach here. It's what Mother Nature does and gets right every time when you look at, when you get the conditions right with your fermenting, which we'll teach. Um, others are using starter cultures, um, and some of that might be because of um, council as well, they're, they're where they are, like it might be regulation from the health, from health and safety, because Reese, they're, if you look at it, if you look at the papers on um, starter cultures, there's it's an industry, right? So their conclusion is always like it's almost like an insurance policy. You're putting in cultures, it sort of guarantees that they're gonna you're gonna get some degree of microbial action. So what that then is doing is it's potentially messing with the natural fermenting cascade of events that occur. Um, so starter cultures are more predictable, for sure, um, and certainly, and it's dependent on what cultures they put in. Peace love vegetables use body ecology. They may change now. I think he was looking at using Caldwell's. Um, I know them quite well, but they ferment for a much shorter period of time, um, whereas Foley's is a good sort of 30-day 30, 30 ferment, um, wild ferment. So, oh yeah, I like to sort of get involved with it and start to finish with it. Um, now, you want to make sure you get rid of the outer leaves, like the ones that have got like all the, the real sort of grotty bits and maybe some bugs and things like that. But the rest of it's pretty good. And everything underneath is fine. Um, and then so for one, for one litre, you want to use about 750 grams of cabbage, okay? So what have, when you use 750 grams, when you massage it all down and you pack it in the jar, it'll come to a good level that doesn't overfill and it's not too little, like it's just perfect, right? I've done this a million times, 750 grams works, perfect for one litre. So if you wanted to upscale with like a seven litre crop, you just time your recipe by seven, and that's how much you would use if you had a two litre jar, you guys get the, get the, get the idea. So, 750 grams. Can you just run through all that? Yeah. Or it turns itself off a little bit turbo mode. Can you see that? 362. You can just like this go like this every so often so it doesn't turn itself off. Otherwise, I will cut myself so I'll go to the. This is where Barry Manilow will save me, <laughs> the awkward silences. Everyone can think of amazing questions to ask them. It's as, it's as bad as a, an awkward day. I don't know what to say, hey. 
and I'm a bad guy. Someone who's shy, you love chatting when you've got an audience though. You can't shut him up sometimes. He's actually being a bit subdued tonight. Sometimes, literally, I just need to just push him away or something. What's the, what's the end goal? 750, did you 7, say? 750. We actually use we actually, There's a few important reasons as to why you weigh. Like one is so you can, you know, you get the right amount for your thing. But also, this is where, this is one of the critical things. It's rarely ever, I have, I've ever seen a recipe online that that's covers this, which is really important, is the salt ratio. Because you've got to get that right. If you get, if that's off, then you're not going to inhibit enough of the bad bacteria. If it's if it's too low, if it's too high, then you kill off too many of the good microbes that are already on there, and then that's, they're not going to proliferate, and then it's again a blank canvas for anything to take over. So the window is 1.5 to 3%. So in other words, 1.5% of 750 grams, and you're at, or up to 3%, so somewhere in that vicinity. And the research is pretty conclusive that about 2.25% is fairly well bang on for a consistent um, wild ferment outcome every time. Because what happens in the fermenting process is what's called succession. Actually, I taught, I, I got invited to speak to high, high school recently, the year 11 and year 12s. There's a school back my way that's the only one that, that does this, a health and medical program for the year 11 and 12 students. And those guys were like really switched on and knew so much stuff about the gut and all this stuff. And one of them caught me off guard when I was going on about it. And they said, is that succession? Like, I'm assuming you guys don't know, haven't heard of the word succession with microbiology. Um, anyway, so that succession is the sequence, the characteristic sequence of events that occur in a given environment. So when we massage this um, and get make the brine in that specific salt ratio, put it in that specific environment that has no oxygen, succession takes place. So the first one, days one to two, maybe day three, a certain set of action microbes um, alter the pH to a certain level, yeah? And then that pH is more favourable for a different set of lacto um, lactic acid organisms, and then they they proliferate and go more, and then the pH changes again, and basically the environment's just more conducive for whatever. So a bit like weeds, really, like it's sort of dependent on what's going on in the soil. Like, um, in fact, this is very analogous to organic farming, which I'll cover in a sec. But that's succession. So that occurs roughly over about a four to six week period. Um, which is the, the life cycle, I suppose, of the fermenting period. But so you, some of these recipes that are saying, you know, ferment for two days or three days and then you just start eating, I think that, well, I think that's unsafe because there's not, there's, there, hasn't, there hasn't been enough time to kill off the, the bad organisms, um, for one. And um, it's not very, probably not very densely populated with a broader um, species of microbes. It's very specific and very narrow range. Um, I think it's like the Bacillus mesenterioides and Leuconostat are the main two at the start, and then it just goes more and more and more. But um, where was I going with that? Succession. Yeah. <laughs> so there's. <laughs> So and when you've been engaged to him, you're so sick of... No, I'm just joking. <laughs> I won't even go there with that. So He's a wizard. So who knows what 2.25% of 750 grams is? Yeah. Without who's the a, phone. Who's a, who's a who's maths, maths, maths wizard? Yeah. It's a test. Could be a door prize Actually, up for running here. Yeah? usually someone that knows it that can just like add it up. 17. Pretty close. 16, yeah. 17, something that's like that. Cool. Yep. So, and this, and, and that's why... Uh, I'll just do this because I only do one thing at a time. Man. Man, one thing at a time. And a, a man with streptococcus overdose, so... <laughs> <laughs> it doesn't work too well in these situations. Yeah. That's pretty good. Yeah. I'm happy with that, yeah. So that was 15 grams. So that means it's going to be slightly under 2.25%, but it's, got, it's still going to be above 1.5. So the recipes that say, you know, a tablespoon of salt or a teaspoon of salt that's you know that might fluke it and fall in that that somewhat narrow range of 1.5 to 3 percent but it, you know there's a good chance it may not so it's quite important um, and again we've mentioned mentioned the salt and then from there like the most basic of basic krauts is something like caraway seeds thrown in there um, so you just sort of depending on your flavor preference it's just uh, Not too many caraway seeds is my advice. Otherwise, they it do sort of gets this soaked in the taste. Yeah? Not, not good. 
lots of juniper berries, I reckon, is better. Juniper berries are great, yeah. yeah. And I think in the, the recipe... Do we have juniper berries? Oh, we'll put them in I think up. we put juniper berries, yeah. um, bay leaves, kind of what's, what Foley's do as their basic crap. And then from there, this is when you really probably should get Barry Manilow out and the candles and do your thing. So you start massaging and talking to your veggies. And yeah, speak about it is way better than this. <laughs> <laughs> You're going to see now what I want by the This is a good workout for the arms. People are, people are soft these days, eh? Hey? <laughs> I'm mean, like an 8 kilo baby, like 10,000 times a day. Not my, not my baby either. <laughs> <laughs> Just to clear that up. He's Italian though, my baby. <laughs> Just like you. Speculation. <laughs> um, <laughs> a what? <laughs> you need to get some trash TV. No, nah, because it'll mulch it down. It'll mulch it down too much. Right Well, you could get a you could get a wooden utensil. You and know, in the, like I don't want to say the olden days, but you know they used to pound it. They used to put it in a vessel. That you used sound like a <laughs> that Barry Manilow playing, pounding the cabbage. <laughs> All sorts of innuendos here. Yeah. So yeah, you can like use. The... <laughs> I'm just gonna go See? back to making my sauerkraut. Sauerkraut's a sexy process, go. right? She, she goes alright. Oh my god, okay, stop. You're making me blush again. It's all, it's all me, it was all me. Anyway, um, so yeah, so if, with your hands, it, it like, it's to get like properly serious with it again. When you're doing it with your hands, you, you're, it's a good, it just works perfectly because it's not too rough and it's not going to like break it down and shred it and things like that. All it's doing is it's just breaking down the cell walls, releasing that water content from the cabbage, which is a lot in there, and mixing the salt through. Because you want the salt to mix through homogeneously as well. Because even like local areas when you pack it in, that where the, if the salt's off, and that can harbour yeast spores and things like that. So you do want a, a nice, want it nicely mixed through. Ah, really painful. <laughs> oh. You can. Too, too little will, yeah, that will, that's not going to be salty enough to inhibit the bad pathogenic organisms or the ones, the undesirables that we don't want, so yeast and things like that. That actually works, yeah. The, my friend calls that the double fist screw pound technique. You get in there, you reckon he's putting a patent on it, so you get in there, you just sort of, I don't know, get pushed out and then you turn your wrist. Usually, this when I do it, it usually takes about 15 minutes, like I sit down this is all podcast or something, it takes a while. And maybe if you've got super muscles like this guy here, maybe it's a shorter process. But yeah, it's a, it's You're doing a good job. Labor intensive. Sometimes, it's a time for questions. sometimes if I pull people out in the audience, it's pretty, can be pretty painful. Some slow ones. Um, any questions? Kale? Kale's very strong. Um, so I recommend, and in fact, I've got a YouTube video on, and I think I'll put kale in there. Um, so I recommend with kale, just going pretty light on with it, just have it as a sort of an adjunct. Um, otherwise, it can be quite powerful and really overpower the flavour. So this is probably a good time to sort of explain how you can diversify yeah, now while she's doing this. So if you, um, if the, so we know 750 grams fits well in one litre. So say you wanted to change the flavours up a bit. I still recommend using cabbage as your main bulk. So say 60% cabbage, so 60% of 750 grams worth of cabbage. Maybe 20% 20, 20 of, say, beetroot that you either like finely cut up or maybe grate or something like that. 20, so we're up to, what are we now, 80. And then maybe 10, another 20% of something else, like carrot or something like that. Um, but you get the idea, like, Use maybe like 50 to 60% of your, of your, as your bulk is cabbage and then play around with the other different flavours and whatever whatever else you're sort of interested in, whatever works. So green, uh, red cabbage works perfectly fine. Um, yeah. 
Savoy's a bit, it's a bit more fibrous. Yeah, it doesn't, I don't quite like, it doesn't, I, I personally don't like that. It still works, um, but the end product is a bit of a, I, I think it's a bit of a interesting flavour that doesn't agree with me. And like Chinese cabbage is quite fast to leave that one. Chinese, so the Napa cabbage, that's more kimchi. Like the ones that are sort of long and up, like, yeah, yeah. 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 That's a bit of a different process. That's a different process, yeah. Like it's a bit beyond all this. Leave yeah. it. But you can make a kraut chi. Did you talk about that already? No. Like... Well, this, that's a kraut chi. Yep. <laughs> yeah. Um, I don't know if I want to show you, and then you might not eat it. <laughs> I've seen them getting in there with boots in big bats um, at one place. Uh, at Peace Love Vegetables, they, they do this all by hand, start to finish. Taste test every batch, they've been doing that from day dot. I went in and had a look at their facility. Um, they've got like 50 something staff there. Follies, I think, yeah, same sort of thing. It's pretty well like manual labour. Or some, in some way, shape, Crazy. or form. That would be a terrible job, making crowds. There's machines that like that mulch this up, though. Like it looks like a like one of those mulches, yeah, like garden mulches that you put in, and it just sort of shoots it out. Like they got that down. Like they can mulch, they can mulch a whole heap of cabbage real quick. Uh, but yeah, the actual this process here, it's pretty well what you see is what you get type of thing. I think. No, that's that's pretty good. There's brine there. Yeah. No, that'll, that'll work perfectly. So you want, you need brine. I, I would probably keep doing that until I got more brine, but just so that you're not bored out of your skull. If your hands were sore, you needed the brine. Would you like it to come over and come back for like half an hour and it would have kept breaking down? It will, yeah, because yeah. especially the, the salt draws the liquid out. So if you naturally leave it like that, that will start sucking some of the salt out. The other thing is, the, the other component to that is then, you know, then you're taking the wild ferment and sort of playing that part a bit more. Like, yeah, so letting it's kind of like a sourdough culture. Come in. Mm. Yeah. It's just going to be yeast and stuff, so I, I don't know. <laughs> I don't know about all that. Okay. So I like these things here. These just with the make working with these a lot easier, um, especially when you're transferring. You no, you're going to put it in. So you just, you, there's no. May, there's no major things you need to adhere to here, just usually a couple of handfuls at a time. So you just usually, I usually give it a bit of a squeeze to get the brine out first. Um, not essential, but I just, this is what I do. But I don't do that, so as you can see, I'm not doing it. Now, after that point, so you want to start packing in, because you want to try and squeeze all the oxygen out now. So if you've packed it all in at once, then it's much harder. So if you do two or three, like three or four handfuls at a time, then start pushing out, you're going to it's just much more. <laughs> for, someone who's, for someone who's OCD, back. I am the I am the messiest person. I have total OCD, and I make the biggest mess always. I don't know. So as long as I, maybe the amount of times I like I had to eat up. dinner, like get started on dinner because you're still cleaning, <laughs> you're paranoid about mess. As long as I can clean it. <laughs> These things here, just like um, kitchen stores, um, is it called House? One, I think yeah. I got this from a place called House. Or online, same place you get the Fido's, because I think it's the same, might be the same company. Um, you can often often find these as part of the part of the kits and things like that. Baby. Give yourself some credit. I know. Good. I'm impressed with that. Yeah, that's good. Round of applause. <laughs> um, and again, this is where you like your paper towels and all that sort of stuff come in handy because, as you can see, it does get a little bit messy. Um, some some people are more messier than others, and that's fine. Um, but yeah, so I just give it a good wipe around around the top, and then also on the inside edge. Okay. So you just get, make sure you get any little scape artists that kind of climb on the top there and didn't fall down. And then with the lid, it's pretty straightforward. Um, oh, hang on, I've got to put this clip on. This, the rubber seal just goes around. Like, I don't even reckon I need to teach this. I'm pretty sure you, everyone would figure this out. But anyway, um, I do have a YouTube video as well of this one. 
but yeah, the rubber clip goes around, just make sure it's full, um, there's no creases. It's getting dark. Yeah, that's good. Um, yeah, the lid straight on, and then the um, flip, just easiest way, just thumb and, thumb and index finger, just open it up like that. Okay, straight down the middle, and then that'll, that clips over, no worries, just like that. Um, and then to take it off, you can do the reverse, um, but I'll save you, I did that for about four years and it's much harder than just sliding it off. It's much easier. <laughs> Plus, just, just uh, on, in all seriousness, these lids are a little bit sharp underneath, not like razor sharp, but you know, when you've sort of got a clip that's pretty tight and you, you slip or something, you know, that doing that reverse, you know, you are going to be prone to an accident. So straight down and that's no problem, and then you slide off as you need. So as you can see, it's not completely full, which you don't want to do. Like, if you completely fill them up over the next week or so, when it's particularly in the first week, they tend to be more active. That's when, especially after sort of day three, um, things start to really start um, kicking off. Um, they will bubble and they basically reabsorb, the cabbage reabsorbs some of the brine and expands as well. Um, and then, yeah, so it rises and then will overfill if it's too full to start with. So that's pretty much spot on. Even that's pretty close, like usually a little bit a little bit less and that works quite well. Is there enough brine on top of the like, solid cabbage okay? Not quite easy? enough, not quite enough. So the brine, you want a, a good clear brine level. So you've got two options, you either do it right from the start and you massage a bit more so you create more, or if it, if it is like that, you can add a little bit of just pure filtered water. Um, then just to just to top it up, and then that's enough. So that was well spotted. Um, and then, so what happens generally in the first week is that lev that brine layer, so that level of fluid on top of the vegetables, will dry out, kind of like how it was there. What I recommend doing is just taking the lid off, get the back of a clean spoon, and you just push it back down. Okay, you sort of because it they, they just sort of rise, kind of rise back up um, from that pressure, and then it'll go sink below, back below the brine, um, which is what you what you're after. If it's doing it very consistently, you may need to again add a little bit of filtered water. If you want, you can add a pinch of salt just to just to be sure. But that'll do the trick. There's other techniques where people recommend using weight devices and things like that. Um, so, like a glass weight plate to sit on top of it. The fermenting crops have them. They have the ceramic, um, two ceramic things that sit on top and keep it down. With this size volume, like I haven't found it necessary. Um, so we've tried it out and we've used all the different recommendations and techniques. Um, but I find them more hassle than good, to be honest. Like especially the the, the, the outer cabbage leaf technique. We get the outer cabbage leaf and you pack that on top to act as kind of like a weight device. It's still going to dry out and then that's still going to get dry and then bits of cabbage that go on top of that and then that creates more mould. I've never found that useful. It just so happens to be the easiest easiest method, like literally doing nothing, seems to work pretty pretty well. Um, well we don't have any troubles. And I was thinking about how many people we've taught now and it's over a thousand and never had anyone come back and say that since following this, this, this protocol that they've had any troubles um, and we've had many people come in and say they've come in because they keep having mould issues and problems and some of those have been emailed back later on and, um, and told us that they um, you know they don't have any troubles now and that it's probably the salt ratio I think is the main is the main one and the jars because there's still people recommending screw top jars out there it's not good enough unless if it's a bull mason jar those specific canning jars from America they it's a two-piece um, spiral lid that will work but at, at some point it will it'll fa it'll fail like as the gas builds up it'll the lid will buckle but you, you know you know with that when it does buckle but like the Fido one you just you can burp it every so often and it's um it won't it'll yeah stick the room out for a bit and then um, and then it's fine what you ate over there as it sort of oxidizes a bit and ferments and breaks down and obviously it changes um, so yeah, time frame is we in our in the notes we recommend sort of two to four weeks. Okay.
okay? As, a, as you've mentioned, time in at room temperature, sort of 18 to 22 degrees is that ideal. Um, like I said before, winter has been a bit has been a bit trickier, um, I must say. Uh, and out of direct UV light is always a good idea as well. Um, so, two that at four weeks you're going to have a more diverse group of bacteria than you are than two weeks. But also, so the other thing with with these cements is so obviously you all get the idea we've covered this uh, at length now that about microbes and the bacteria that are in there that are, that are good for us but there's the whole other there's, there's a lot of other things as well does anyone like what does anyone know like what some of the other benefits are of fermented foods like what else happens aside from the probiotics Could be a door prize on up for grabs here Yeah. Yep. There's all that sort of stuff. I'm. I'm. Um, the answers I was sort of looking for was that there's the nutri nutrition nutritional profile changes and increases. So B vitamins increase across the board. Vitamin C increases. That's the story behind Captain Cook coming over and so, you know sauerkraut's probably you know has a piece piece to pay as, as to how we're all here actually because Captain Cook brought over mass, massive amount of sauerkraut in, um, on their voyage over here. Um, and that's what prevented scurvy, the, the vitamin C that's in the sauerkraut. It's true that um, it's thin, it's exactly. There we go. Perfect. Perfect. That's that's what I was after. So the different so, price. Yeah. Um, so <laughs> the new, the new, when I say nutritional profile, so there's that side of it. But then this is the chemical. So what's in this here at the moment and on, in this cabbage is what's uh, uh, glucosalinates. Okay, they're relatively biologically inactive. So when we eat them raw they don't have that much therapeutic effect. Through the fermenting process, through enzymatic reactions and um, enzymes like myronase and things like that, they get con that, those glucosalinates get converted into uh, isothiocyanates, um, indole-3-carbonyl, and, and it's Rebecca, isn't it? And Rebecca mentioned DIM as well, um, di-iodo-methane, something like that. So you get these other chemicals which aren't in the, the raw form. You get that, right? These are the ones that have therapeutic effects. The main one with, with DIM and I, I3C um, and isothiocyanates, ascorbogen as well, is the excess estrogen detoxifying capacities that they have, which is a big thing in today's society. Estrogen's, uh, excess estrogen and estrogen dominance, all that sort of stuff is implicated with cancers and things like that. Um, whereas these, um, these chemicals assist um, Detoxifying those excess estrogens, just to keep it as simple as simple as it can get. So you take, yeah. Um, so that was what I was after. So and then you guys are really the first one of the first people to notice because this was only published this year. With with these chemicals, they actually peak at about day seven to nine, and then they start tapering off. So if you're after you know for the estrogen detoxifying effects, then you may want to cap it maybe at day seven to nine. Because um, sort of, we know that that's when those levels are, are actually highest. We're obviously, not going to get the most probiotics then, um, but you know, that's where I guess if you want to take it into a functional food and you know therapeutically and things like that, you can sort of look at it more like you know food as medicine, I suppose, from that angle. Since you're talking about the stage of the fermentation. Yeah. Um, and then and then from there after that, say say you wanted to cap it at two weeks or four weeks. I recommend taking it out of here using that thing again, that, on, in, that little um, funnel type thing. Just getting like, then you can, can get transferred into the standard screw top jars. So you can put it in the fridge and it's no problem then. Um, and then you've got your jar free to, to get your next batch on the go. Out what's left of the liquid, so a bit like when you buy the coffee stuff, it's that tiny bit of water or fried mm -hmm. at the bottom, it's mostly just cabbage. You want to try and capture all that. You don't want to, you don't want to throw out all that excess brine. No, not so much throw it out. I mean, when you're transferring it just to the jar yep. uh, before it into the fridge. Yeah. Do you want to just transfer it as it is, or you, you could just transfer that out. straight in, okay. um, like like this. But I like to just put it into new jars, so then you've got these ones free again. Does that answer the question? And don't you think also? I find sometimes you actually lose. It does dry out a little. Yeah, dries out like it reabsorb. The cabbage will reabsorb it a bit. 
So you're really basically putting it into the fridge to stop the fermentation. Yeah, well, it, it, technically it probably has stopped fermenting. Once it reaches a certain pH, and I can't remember the number now, um, what level that is, that's when, um, from a microbiology perspective, fermentation has ceased. Um, but if, it's, if you did it at two weeks, it's still definitely fermenting on a, the fermenting capacity. So when you put it in the fridge, you're slowing it right down. Like, it will still ferment. And there was a question before about histamine levels. Um, and you know, some people may be recommending ferment for, say, six weeks, chuck in the fridge for maybe four weeks, and then start getting into it because it might lower the histamines. Um, I haven't seen that data. Um, histamines, generally, like that sounds counterintuitive because histamines, like with leftover food, you put in the fridge, it builds up histamines, yeah? So I, I don't see how fermented foods would be any different, like leaving them longer, how that would reduce them. Maybe it does, I don't know, I haven't seen the data though. But histamines and histamine issues, again, comes down to the whole gut thing. And histamine's a neurotransmitter, just like serotonin, dopamine, all those important neurotransmitters. And they're largely dictated by what's going on in the gut and the microbes. So certain microbes in the gut, like E. coli, the good E. coli, um, like Escherichia coli, that ferments to produce tryptophan, um, tyrosine, uh, coins on Q10, vitamin K2. So those cofactors in conjunction with vitamin D and zinc and other important things go on, and go on to produce serotonin, dopamine, all the important neurotransmitters. So you can look at you know, these neurotransmitter disorders being you know, from one side, like up here, and like, okay, so how do we alter them with drugs and things like that? Or why don't we think, well, what, why is there issues there? And what, that's where like, the micro, whole microbial thing comes into play. So if you've got low E. coli, you're not producing these important amino acids and you're not getting them in through your diet, and of course you're going to have problems with producing these neurotransmitters. Um, so that's where sort of all this, this helps, um, getting all that into balance. And but this is the time we were just talking about using the juice from the Asdu style culture for your grass. Would that be the point where we take out a couple of tablespoons? You could, but we're going to we're going to teach how to make that, that separately. So altogether. that's a separate thing because there's not typically enough brine in there to use as a starter culture for say the kvass. It would probably be two tablespoons. So. That's so what a nice you do? For us to yeah. Out. Marcus, I looks like juice. a hell of a lot of water. Yeah. Yeah. Exactly. So this is so what so sauerkraut juice, and I don't I, I just made this up. I just sort of wanted I wanted to make some culture. So all I do is exactly what we just did. Okay, you got two options. You get three of these, or you get one three liter jar. Okay, 750 grams of cabbage. Exactly what we did. Transfer those into three three one liter jars so e evenly. Okay, or one three liter jar, which is going to fill it to about there. Okay, and then top it up with um, with filtered water. Okay, so now it's all dispersed through. Originally, this started off completely packed in, and the rest was just sitting on top. It was just just liquid. You'll see the pictures in your in your manual as well. But as it goes over time, like it just sort of disperses through, and, and that's that creates. This is yeah. Yeah, you put the all that water in post fermentation. Or no, no, you put the, put the water in at the start. So you do exactly what we just did there. Um, pack it in there, chuck your water in, um, and then seal it up. That's it. Good to go. But Same what's thing. Your dilution with salt, because your dilution with salt makes it more too much. Not yeah. So that that one there, I'd recommend using probably go more on the three percent salt. But it's it's yeah, it is compression. Um, I haven't had any issues with mold or anything doing that though. So I think it's probably it's more applicable to the amount of salt per vegetable as opposed to volume of liquid. Does that make a bit of sense? Seems to work anyway. Yeah. And then, yeah, same, same thing, you just let it, let it ferment. And then to, yeah, then you just strain it. So, do you want to grab the, the um, I gave it a wash. So you just need, you know, like a, something big like that. Yeah, the funnel's there as well. So then you just get, um, you sort of compress it through so you can get all the liquid and then you, 
um, for, for tonight I'm just going to throw this back in here. But I just would put that in a, again, like in a normal jar into the fridge and you can just eat that. It's just a little bit, not as, not as concentrated. concentrated and it's diluted a bit. Yeah, it's a bit more dry. So, um, good questions. How long do they keep in the fridge? So, most of the commercial companies, and I've asked, I keep asking them, and they never, no one's ever been able to give me a true answer. But they just, they just put a year on them as an expiry date. So, it seems to be that um, that's sort of the, the consensus. I don't know if anyone's ever done this a good study on it and really looked at it, but they all seem to put, they all just seem to. I looked at doing beet kvass commercially for a while, so I contacted all the big guys in America and all that sort of stuff, and they just couldn't give me an answer. They just said they'd just use a year. That um, uh, good question, but I don't think I'm not sure if it makes too much difference after or before you open. Maybe they might. Some of them might say on their label, consume within three three months of. Yeah. Yeah, once the, the difference with that is this has been fermented and produced a lot of good bacteria, so there's a, a whole heap of good, good microbes there now, so that's what you want. So they would naturally ward off pathogens and the, and the bad, bad bugs. So when you're introducing a bit of oxygen, it's okay for a little bit here and there, it's just it's, what's not good is if you use, those, like I said, those screw top jars overnight, say it opens up, and then it's left for, say, eight hours or whatever, and oxygen's coming in. A little bit here and there, no big deal, but. Um, just to get some of the carbon dioxide a little bit in. But that will, when you do the those, unless if you like got lightning reflex and you like ch -ch -ch open it, close real quick because pressure can't physics pressure can't go two ways. Yeah, that's why the fowlers are great because when that pressure off gases and it, and it locks back up straight away, nothing gets in because it, it's like you know when you fire water out of a hose, nothing can come can come in. Same same sort of principle. Um, and then you just, like your beef bash, you just you just bottle that up. You just, yeah, sauerkraut juice. There's another another recipe that I've developed for use for this stuff here. Like if you didn't want to didn't want to eat that, so or like you just you had all the other good kvass. Sorry, all the other good kraut that's more tasty. What you can do is you can make probiotic dust. That's what I call it anyway. Put it, you just basically put it in a in, in a dehydrate food dehydrator, line it all out, and dehydrate, and it, it like shrivels down to hardly anything. And I brought mine along. This here, that's about how much you get out of it. <laughs> <laughs> so you can use that as um, like like seasoning on salads and stuff like that. It's pretty cool. Robotic dust. Someone will probably trademark it now. Um, but yeah, that's what I tend to do with that with that one. Um, or chooks? Oh, it's good for good for animals, maybe. Sorry. Sorry. Do you leave that for the same amount of time as you leave yeah. that one? Yeah. Same. So everything's exactly the same. Yeah. And then instead of putting it in the fridge, then you're just straining it off, capture, capturing your, your your juice, and you're good to go. Um, that's a, that's a good question. So, do you have to eat it raw, or can you cook it? So, if just. Know that if you cook it, you're going to kill probably a fair chunk of the microbes, if not all of them. Um, and then what you're left with is still a food, which is no. And this is getting back to the whole, you know, if you've got the option of taking a store-bought probiotic or something like a fermented food, you know, the fermented food has all these other things too, not just you know a couple of strains of you know, some acidophilus and rhamnosus and you know, some bifidobacteria. You've got all the other other, you know, you've got fibre for one, the, the feeding source of the microbes. Which is in a probiotic. My 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 thoughts on all this with probiotics and what's going to happen is it'll be way more tightly regulated and that we won't be buying them off the shelf like we do um, because we with the, with the information that we know um, you know if someone's got a, a lactobacillus, lactobacillus overgrowth why should they be taking these I mean pretty much every probiotic on the market there's only one that I know that's a straight up bifido um, they're just going to make this, make it worse. And then there's other issues as well. So Streptococcus reduces a lot of D-lactate. Certain lactic acid, certain lactobacillus organisms also produce D-lactate. So then you've got to be very picky about what 
probiotics you use. So that's where probiotics are good for therapeutic intervention. If you know your microbiology and you actually understand this stuff, um, fermented foods is a much, in my opinion, much better starting point um, and safer starting point. But again, if, you, if you're reacting to them, because people react to probiotics as well, like a lot of people say, you know, they take probiotics, they got worse. So it's a stab in the dark, um, unless you're testing. But like I said before, say you, you start all this and you're having your little bit of fermented foods with every meal and you're still feeling a bit, it's, you know, it's stirring things up a little and you're pushing through for say 10 days and nothing's changing, it's still push, still persisting. Seven to 10 days seems to be that magic mark I've, I've found clinically, like people tend to get to that point, it's like, oh, then it's all gone and they're feeling good. Um, but if it persists on past there, then that's when, that's when I recommend maybe contacting someone and um, finding out who's, who works with this sort of work and can maybe help out. So we've got a bit of time, any, any more questions? Yeah, so there's, a, so there's a lot of salt. So I guess when you, when you look at it um, over the, over the like it, I guess it's more diluted than maybe what it looks like. So I don't think it's probably as salty as maybe what, we, what people may think, but it's fast to say there's definitely salt in there, yeah? So if salt's an issue, then you, know, you, you may want to consider. That, this is where it's kind of good. It works as a natural condiment to food. So then you don't have to add salt to foods. Um, it's a good question, and, and I like that because it, that um, it is important to, to, to weigh into that. So, um, and, and I don't think anyone's ever asked that before. So I'm going to think about this for a second. Um, yeah. So if you, if you, I think keep that's a good point. Keep in mind that we like the meal that you're having it with. So let's say you're having it with. Um, a, a chick, a, you know, on the side with, a, with some, salmon. oh yeah, crispy salt salmon that's got, you know, lathered in salt, right? Then you might overdo the salt, for sure, because because that's usually pretty salty. Um, yeah, and I think that's controversial in its own yeah, right. Yeah, I mean, that's probably more about sodium chloride than actual amazing mineral yeah. salt anyway, you know, which you might potentially be deficient in. Yeah, that is a conversation. It's a good thing about these salts is they've got all those trace elements and, and minerals, um, which you don't get in standard table salt. Which going on to the bringing out the water, the water component. So with the, the, I've done a bit of research and looked at all like a lot of different companies. Not every single company in Australia, but I looked at some of the big players. And um, I spoke to a microbiologist over in Victoria. Um, he's a head lecturer on water and. She was adamant that you have to filter water and even rainwater, all that sort of stuff, even more so actually. Um, but so the, so the one that I quite like and endorse is the Zazen water filters. Um, we do have the links for all that on in your notes. Um, that seems to do a good job filtering most of the fluoride out. Doesn't back drop fluoride back in like some of the others do. Um, takes out a lot of the nasty stuff, but also remineralizes the water. So reverse osmosis will take out all the bad stuff, which is good. We want that. But it doesn't, unless if you've got to remineralize it, a part of it, it won't remineralize the water. Um, in which case, then, you know, maybe that's potentially dangerous because then through osmosis, it might start leaching your own minerals out. So the Zazen system adds minerals back in. Um, and I won't go into any more detail than that, but that's what I recommend. Yeah. Have you done any research on any form of water filter with IPU up coming? Because I've been talking with actually not being able to get. Because, yeah, everything good, else, because I know America is having yeah. a problem with it at the moment, that they're actually finding... Even cocaine stuff in the UK, I think. Yeah, like, yeah. 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 Um, like homeopathic doses of... Yeah, yeah. Like, yeah. In, in a, a bad way. Zazen's pretty good like that, and that's one of the reasons why I ended up going with them. There was two that I sort of was tossing up with, but why I like Zazen is they're a very good business, and they... Work, they could always get back to me and if I have any questions and something like that, if I want to see their, their lab analysis analyses and things like that, they usually, they're pretty quick on getting them to you. Um, and I'm pretty sure, 
uh, medications and um, some other things were on the oh, on that list. I think so too. They, they've got a lot yeah. of data and research and information yeah. on their website, which we can give you links to. So at the end of the day, you just got to choose the best, the best best option you can get, and you know they may they may not be the, the best, but from what I've come up with, they seem to they check out really good, and their feedback's always been great. But the more you look into things, the worse it is. Like you start getting, <laughs> you don't want to freak everyone out, and I don't want to freak everyone out with the fermented food things. But you know, I have a responsibility. I know this isn't for everyone, and I want people to be clear on that, and I want. People would also understand you know, that the less is more concept and not, don't go too crazy with it. The guy at Bioscreen, the microbiologist who's been doing this for 40 years, he's actually in somewhat anti-fermented foods. And I can see his argument in some ways when he sees everyone's poo that comes in and sees all these results. And he's seen the rise with fermented foods in the last five years and, like lact and lactobacillus overgrowth and things like that. Um, but he made a point one day, he's like, we're putting these ancient foods into a modern day diet. So we're putting in all these microbes and things like that into, with processed sugars and all that sort of stuff and starches. So we've got all these bad organisms potentially feeding them more and you know, adding in the fibre and all that sort of stuff and potentially feeding all these pathogenic overgrowths that are going on. So without freaking you out, you know, it's, it's just the reality of it. Like, we are not healthy, really. Um, and it's not our own fault. Um, you know, we, we, it's just, just how it's panned out, really, unfortunately in a lot of ways, but if you look at ancient tribes, Hudsas, all that sort of stuff, and you look at their poo samples, they've got a very broad broad, back, broad profile of microbes, particularly the bacteroides. Um, and I can say from my experience, that's quite common in our, in, in our society, that bacteroides are usually low. And the worst case I, seen, I saw was, in a, was actually in a vegetarian who had undetectable levels of bacteroides, and that's a massive problem for a vegetarian. So, because bacteroides are what process and digest insoluble fiber, um, so if you don't have those those bacteroides, they're not going to do that, and that's when people. That's why I don't like the saying just eat fiber and fiber's great, all this sort of stuff. Because some, if you don't have the mi right microbes to start with, you won't digest it properly. Because when they when these bacteroides ferment and pr process that insoluble fiber, they produce acetate and butyrate and all these important volatile fatty acids that feed the other microbes in the gut and also fuel us as well, and also fuel the colonocytes that repair the gut. It's all pretty intricate and pretty 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 fascinating. But that's why I like objective testing because then you can sort of really hone in and see see all this sort of stuff. But there is one thing I do want to say and I want to sort of draw like a, a parallel and a, con a sort of concluding um, thing for, you to go, for everyone to go home with. So the organic thing we sort of touched on. So if you look at organic soil and the organic process, right, the cows are really good, um, a good model to follow. So if you look at a cow, it's got four, four guts, most people might seem to understand that, um, four, four stomachs. And they eat the grass and that all those microbes in there ferment and, and produce all these volatile fatty acids, butyrate and acetate, like I said before. So cat, cows are essentially on a high fat diet, really. And they really are just a sauerkraut vessel. So they're fermenting and producing all these microbes and things like that. And then they're pooing it on the ground. It's providing the nutrition for the soil for then the chickens to come along and um, all the, all the good, and feed all the good microbes in the soil. Um, and also feed the microbes for the cabbage to grow in as well. So then that's a continuation of that process, that fermenting process in the cow, that sauerkraut process in the cow. And then we uproot that and then we basically chop it up, do what we just did there and continue on that, that, that natural process. It's like a continuation of that spectrum. And then we eat it and then it's still continuing on. It's doing that same process through the gut microbes and eventually goes down in our toilets. But um, I just think it's a pretty, pretty fascinating life cycle from start to finish. But if you trace it back, like this is the end stage, like where this came from was actually the sauerkraut process in it, kind of in a cow, really, or in the soil, the microbes in the soil. One teaspoon of organic soil has more microbes in it than humans on the planet. Um, it's pretty diverse. And, um, yeah, I just, I just I think it's pretty, pretty fascinating. You guys have got pretty stunned faces. <laughs> okay. I think, so like, if, like yeah, it might not be a problem. Like, if there's no mold looking, because the top layer will. Where did that, where did that come in go? Oh, the top layer, like, you'll see a different, a differing, like, a layering effect. 
So the top will be a bit more brown, it's a bit more oxidised, it generally gets exposed to a bit more, somewhat more air. You can take that off. Not necessarily. And then there's good stuff under there. Yeah, so you, you'll, you'll see this, I mean, it all goes, starts going brown as you saw and what you've tasted, but usually that top layer is a little, a little more brown, sort of a, a layer. You can strip that off and throw it out if you want, if you're worried, um, but yeah, that's not a problem. If there's no like fuzzy mold and doesn't you know, stink real bad and stuff like that, might have wasted a bit of crap there. Yeah. <laughs> okay, yeah. we'll have one more question yeah. and I think we'll wrap up. Yeah. I think the brine, you know, the question about the salt content. Mm. I mean, traditional, uh, traditional um, uh, methods of doing preserving cheese and olive oil, I mean, they use a 10% brine solution. Mm. It doesn't mean that the product is salty, it's the brine that's salty. Yeah. So Good maybe point. the salt isn't actually in the sauerkraut, it's actually it's in, the in the brine. Yeah. So if your salt content, mm. what you're eating, might be very low, because it's, it's in the brine. Yeah, yeah I agree, yeah. I think you're spot on there. The, the brine the brine's what's going to have the salt. I don't think the salt is actually... But the, the thing is, the brine kind of mixes in, like when you eat, when you spoon some out, you're getting the cabbage, yeah? But you're also getting some of the brine as well, a bit of liquid. And it's very little, exactly, yeah. So I don't, I don't, I don't think it is an issue, personally, no. Yeah, I suppose the bass is more homogenous. Yeah, you can be, you can be a bit. The other thing as well with the brines, that's where the, the probiotics are. The cabbage is just the fibre, really. So this is the good stuff in reality if you're after the, the microbes. And that's why gaps and things like that tend to start. Gut and psychology syndrome, diet, that sort of thing, tend to start on sauerkraut juice in a very small amount, like maybe like a cap full, and that's it. And then slowly introduce bit by bit. So thanks for coming tonight and thanks for sharing your energy with us and we definitely look forward to seeing all of your fermentation creations on the Facebook page so don't be shy and you can tag us into anything on social media so yeah thanks for coming thank you